Well, hey, is everyone doing pretty good? Yes. Cool. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing fantastic. All right, if you don't have a Bible, you're going to need it, or you're going to need somebody with a Bible, but everyone should have one because we got plenty in the back, so make sure you go and grab a Bible. We're going to be starting a new series, uh, and we're going to be in this series for the next few weeks called God Is, and we're going to be looking at sort of big picture what the doctrine of God is. Um, this is often referred to as theology proper. If you hear that term, this is what they're talking about. They're talking specifically about the study of God. We often use the term theology to deal with what God has to say about different things. A theology of music, a theology of government, a theology of politics. But theology proper deals specifically with the doctrine of God, understanding who God is uh, in his character and in his nature. And so before we get started, I wanted to read for you um, this quote uh, by a, a guy by the name of J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer was a pastor, a theologian. He wrote plenty of books. He's been very influential in uh, uh, the church, especially in our, our modern age. And here's what he had to say about, uh, about this subject. He said, Christian minds have been conformed to the modern spirit. That spirit that spawns great thoughts of man and leaves room only for small thoughts of God. Now, he wrote that in the 1960s, right? So that was, my goodness, I guess about 60 years ago now. So even in his time when he wrote this, what was that? Oh, I thought you were signaling me for something. Even when he wrote that in the 1960s, he recognized that people in the culture have no room for thoughts about God. Instead, they were consumed with thoughts about themselves, and I think that's particularly relevant in our day. We think so highly of ourselves, and we think so little about who God is. And that's the reason we're going to be in this study, is so that we can have a right understanding, a proper understanding of who God is. Uh, now, before we get started, it's important to note that our goal in this series is not merely intellectual assent or to puff ourselves up with knowledge. It's very easy when we study things like this, to be very infatuated with the idea of amassing knowledge about who God is, but there's a very big difference about knowing about God and actually knowing God and being known by God. And so it's going to be tempting to want to focus in on the intellectual aspects of this series and to miss out on what it means to actually know God. And so as we deal with this subject, we obviously want to know God rightly. That's why it's important to engage in this study. But we have to recognize that merely having the knowledge about God does not mean knowing God. And so each of us needs to examine ourselves and to ask that question that Pastor Tim asks us so often, have I been born again? Do I know God? Am I actually following after Christ? And so we are going to start in this series, God is with the Trinity. We're going to be looking at the fact that God is triune. Does anyone think they can define for me what the Trinity is? Three in one. He's three in one. That is correct. Anyone else? Does anyone have a more specific understanding? Three, th three, three what in one what? Three persons. Three persons in one person? That, that's a contradiction. Either he's three persons or he's one person. Right. And so we're going to be starting with the uh, uh, understanding that God is triune. And the reason we're starting with the Trinity is because when we engage in a study about God, we need to understand that the God that we're dealing with is the one true and living God. We're not dealing with this idea of a higher power or just theism in general, right? We're not just saying that, you know, God, that, you know, that higher power that makes me, you know, kind of is in control, but I don't really know who he is. No, no. We're dealing specifically with the Christian God of the Bible. We're not dealing with any other God, right? We're not dealing with the Jesus of Mormonism. We're not dealing with Allah of Islam. We're not dealing with uh, the, uh, the, the Unitarian God. We're dealing specifically with the triune God that is uh, revealed to us in the scriptures. And so uh, I want to give you a definition of the Trinity uh, some of you may remember this when we did our series on the Trinity a few years ago. Uh, this comes from a fantastic book called The Forgotten Trinity. If you don't have this book, you should buy this book. Sell your shoes, your sibling, whatever you got to do to get this book. Uh, last time we did this series, I gave this book away. Was, was it you? Yeah, I knew it was one of, one of the twins. I gave this book away because they, uh, they did so excellent remembering uh, what we were talking about. And so in this book, The Forgotten Trinity, uh, he gives us a, a very... Uh, specific 
and very pointed definition of the Trinity. Go ahead and put that up on the screen uh, for me. And, and here's what uh, uh, James White lays out. He says, within the one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that seems like a lot of words to define the Trinity, but all of the words that he's using are very specific, and they deal specifically with three uh, pillars of Trinitarian doctrine. One of the things I love about this book is that James White is a textual critic. He's an expert in the field of textual criticism as well as an expert in uh, Greek and Hebrew. He teaches at several seminaries and has taught at several seminaries. But on top of that, not only is he just really, really smart, on top of that, he's also a very accomplished debater. He has engaged in hundreds of debates with everyone from uh, Roman Catholics to Jehovah's Witnesses to Mormons to um, uh, uh, Muslims to um, everyone you can think of. He, he has debated them and has engaged as an apologist with these subjects. So when he's writing this book, he's, he's not only doing it just to give you a bunch of information, but he's also giving you uh, uh, information that will help to shore up your, your knowledge against uh, attacks on the Trinity. And so it's fantastic. Like I say, if you don't have it, you should get it. But what he lays out, if you'll notice in this definition, he underlines, I underlined a, a few things in this definition. And in this definition, what we have are three foundational pillars of Trinitarian doctrine. And those three pillars are, the first one is monotheism. Everyone say that with me, monotheism. Monotheism, monotheism means there is only one God. There's only one. That's what the word means. Mono meaning one, theism meaning God, monotheism. You can move to the next slide. It's got all these on there. The second one is that within this one God, there are three persons. Say that with me. Three persons. Three persons. And those three persons are all co-equal and co-eternal. These are what he lays out as the foundational pillars of Trinitarian doctrine. And you have to hold all of these foundations equally. The example that I like to use is the example of a perfect triangle. Does anyone know what a perfect triangle is? It's a triangle, but what makes it perfect? The sides are the same length. And because the sides are the same length, that means the angles are also the same length. But all three sides are exactly the same length. When it comes to the Trinity, when it comes to these three foundations, we have to hold all three of these things equally. If you lengthen or shorten one side of an equal, uh, equilateral triangle, a perfect triangle, do you have a perfect triangle anymore? No, you don't. If you lengthen or shorten one, you don't have a perfect triangle anymore. It's the same thing with the Trinity. If you overemphasize or de-emphasize one of these foundations, you no longer have the Trinity. For instance, if we uh, overemphasize the fact that there's only one God at the expense of the fact that he exists in three persons, what we end up having is what's called modalism, which is heresy. That says that God is actually just one person who reveals himself in different ways. That's not the Trinity. If we, over, if we hold to something so much that we neglect the other foundations, we don't have the, um, we don't have the Trinity any longer. And so what we're going to do, go ahead and open your Bibles. We are going to be looking at what the Scripture says about these three foundations. Um, we dealt with this much more uh, fully and much, much more exhaustively when we did this series a few years ago. Um, but we're going to be doing sort of a, a quick run-through of what the Scripture says concerning uh, these three pillars. So the first one is going to be monotheism. Go ahead and go to that next slide for me. Uh, and so if somebody will look up uh, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 5 for me. Casey, uh, somebody look up Psalm 83, 18. All right. Uh, somebody look up 2 Samuel 7, 22. Someone look up Isaiah 43, 10. I'll actually take that one because that one's one of my favorites. Uh, somebody else look up Mark 12, 28 through 30. Anybody? All right. And then last one, I need someone to look up uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Who will look that one up for me? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. All right. Awesome. All right. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 5. So we're looking right now at the first pillar of the Trinity, of understanding what the Trinity is, and that's monotheism. Does the Scripture teach that there is only one God? And what we're going to look at in the Scriptures is actually what it has to say about the fact that there is only one God. So Casey, go ahead and start for me. Uh, with that uh, passage of Deuteronomy. Now this 
promise you in the land falling with milk and honey. Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your minds. Awesome. So, if you don't understand what's taking place in this passage, Deuteronomy is, a, is made up of two, it's a compound word, made up of two words, Deutero and Namas, meaning second law. And what's happening here is that Israel is getting ready to enter into the promised land. If y'all remember from Israel's history, they were delivered from Egypt and they got to the wilderness and they said, this is terrible, let's go back to Egypt. It'd be much better to die there than to die here. And what God did is he said, you're going to wander the wilderness for 40 years until this generation dies off and I'm going to let your children take the promised land. And so this second giving of the law is after they've wandered the wilderness for 40 years and they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. And what God does is he gives them the law a second time. He reminds them, hey, you need to remember, you've entered into a covenant with me as my covenant people. You need to remember what my law says. And when he lays out this law for them, as you can see, uh, starting in verse four, he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And he lays out for them. This is the first and the greatest commandment. We'll see this actually reaffirmed by Jesus in the New Testament. We have to understand that the God of the scriptures, the God of Israel, the God who created everything, there is only one. There is no other God. And when he gives his law, which is a reflection of his character, he says, you need to understand that as I'm giving this law, this is given by the one living true God and the only one. All right, let's move on to uh, Psalm 83. Who had that one? All right. Awesome. So we see in this psalm, this psalm is, is a petition from the psalmist to God. Uh, he is in a time of distress. He's being surrounded by his enemies. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the first portion uh, of, of Psalm 83, he says, Oh God, do not keep silent. Do not hold your peace or be still. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. Uh, he is basically petitioning God. God, your enemies are moving against you. And as we get to the end of the psalm, how, what, does he, what does he say is the purpose of, of God moving against his enemies? Well, before we get to that last verse, you can see towards the end of the passage, it says, oh, oh my God, make them like a whirling dust, like chaff before the wind, as the fire consumes the forest, as the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so that you may pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your hurricane. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace. So he's asking God, he's petitioning God, God, please do something. Do something to deal with your enemies. And he gives us the reason why. Why does he give us the reason? Is it, is it because, because I'm in distress and I don't like being uncomfortable? No. He says, I want you to move against your enemies. And the reason I want you to move against your enemies is so that they may know that you alone are God. Move against your enemies. Come and do this great thing. Why? So that you, people may understand, your enemies may know that there is no other God except you. You alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high God. And if you look, if you look there where it says Lord, you'll see that the L-O-R-D is in all caps. Um, uh, sometimes they'll put it in all caps, but they'll make the last three letters a little bit smaller, but they're still capital letters. That's what's known in scripture as the tetragrammaton. Say that for me, tetragrammaton. It's kind of a mouthful. It literally just means four letters. That's what the word means. Tetragrammaton means four letters. And when you see that, that word, Lord, in all caps, translated into English, that's actually God's covenant name, Yahweh, where they just wrote it with four letters, Y-H-W-H, -H is how they spelt that out. And so that's, a, that's an interesting piece. That's kind of just some, some knowledge for yourself. When you see that Lord in all caps, that's actually God's covenant name, Yahweh. But it's important to know that the psalmist is identifying Yahweh, the God of Israel, as the only God, right? Not as one God among many, but that uh, uh, he alone, whose name is the Lord, whose name is Yahweh, is the most high over the earth. Um, who had uh, 2 Samuel 7.22? All right, go ahead and read that nice and loud for us. Again, this is a great passage. David is uh, offering a prayer of gratitude uh, to God. And in this uh, prayer of gratitude, he identifies uh, there in verse 22, therefore you are great, O Lord God. Again, we see that Lord in all caps. That's your grammaton, remember that. Uh, so he says, therefore you are great, O Yahweh God, for there is none like you, there is no God besides you according to all that we have heard with our ears. Now David was king of Israel, so he was a pretty smart guy 
But he's saying that, hey, even in all the knowledge that I've amassed up to this point, my ears have heard of no other God besides you. Right? He identifies Yahweh as the only God. Next, we're going to Isaiah 43.10. And I said I'd take that one because that's one of my favorites. So in Isaiah 43.10, it says, uh, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Again, we see that Lord in all caps. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. What's taking place in this passage is this is right in the middle of what is known as the trial of the false gods. And in here, it's usually uh, considered between Isaiah 40 through like 45, 46-ish. And what's taking place is that God is actually calling to the table. He's actually calling out the false gods of, of the enemies of Israel. And he's telling them, uh, if you look back in chapter 41, he says this, he says, uh, uh, chapter 41, verse 21, he says, uh, he says to these idols, right, these false gods, set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, and this is excellent, in verse 24, behold, you are nothing and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. So God calls to the carpet these false gods, right? And he calls them out and says, hey, if you are a true God, come here and tell us what's going to take place in the future. Tell us the past. Not only tell us what happened in the past, but tell us why it happened. Tell us what was meant by it. And he, he basically just comes back in verse 24 and says, behold, you're nothing, right? Because you're made of nothing. You don't have mouths, so you can't tell me what's going to happen. You don't have ears, so you can't hear what I'm saying to you. And, and, that's, and that's the context of what is, is, is said in Isaiah 43, where he says, Before me no God was formed, and neither shall there be after me. And so God is basically calling these false gods to the table. He basically tells them you're nothing. You're made with human hands. You can't see anything. You can't hear anything. You can't do anything. Uh, and he, uh, in this uh, trial of the false gods, he lays out, there is no God that has been formed. And uh, when we look next week, we're going to be looking at what's known as the creator-creature distinction. And basically, uh, uh, this, this passage is very important for understanding the creator-creature distinction. Because if something had been formed, that means it's not God. Right? If it had to be made, that means it's not God. If it was made by human hands, that means it's not God. And so God is laying out the fact that before me there is no God formed, and nor shall there be after me. He is the only God. And he even says that in verse uh, 11, just following verse 10. He says, I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. All right, who had uh, Mark 12, 28 through 30? All right, go ahead and read that nice and loud for us. Awesome. So that, that sounds familiar, right? We just heard that back in Deuteronomy. These uh, scribes and these Pharisees are questioning Jesus, and they're asking him, hey, what is the greatest commandment? And what does Jesus do? He quotes the Old Testament, right? He quotes, he quotes Deuteronomy and says, here is the greatest uh, law. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus affirms the fact that there is only one God. And he highlights that, and he reaffirms that here in the New Testament. And then lastly, let's look at 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Who had that one for me? That was Joe. All right, so what's happening in this passage is that uh, people had some questions for Paul because uh, what was taking place is, is uh, the pagans were offering sacrifices to false gods, 
They were offering lambs and they were offering goats and all these things as sacrifices. And then the Christians were worried about their conscience because they said, can I eat this food that was offered as a sacrifice to these idols? And what does Paul do? Almost, he almost quotes, basically, uh, the trial of the false gods. And he says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. It's exactly what Yahweh said. You're nothing. These idols are nothing. These false gods are nothing. And that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So we see, starting in the law, moving through the, uh, the Psalms, the wisdom literature, moving into the prophets, and then even moving into the Old Testament in the Gospels and in the Epistles, we see the Scripture affirm over and over and over and over again that there's only one God. There's only one. There's not multiple gods. There's not, uh, there's not higher gods and lesser gods. There's not gods of this world and gods of other worlds. There's only one, and that's it. Scriptures testify to that over and over again. And there's so much more we can look on this subject. Uh, but uh, this is just kind of a quick run-through of what the Scriptures say about monotheism. And so we're going to look at the second pillar, which is that this one God exists in three persons. If you remember from our definition, he said within the one being that is God, there eternally exists three co-equal and co-eternal persons. This is sometimes a hard distinction for us to understand, this distinction between being and person. And it's very difficult for, un for us to understand because we are one being and one person, and God is one being and three persons. That part doesn't quite make sense to us. But we understand the difference between being and person. If I looked at uh, this sitting in front of me and I said, what is that? Right? We would all rightly look at that and say that is a human being. But it would also be a completely separate question to look at that and go, who is that? Well, that is a human being and his name is Josiah, right? We understand that he is a being and he is also a person. Same thing, if we go outside and cut a tree down, we, re we don't mourn the tree, we don't have funerals for the trees because we recognize that although the tree has being, right, if it fell on you, it would hurt really bad, but it doesn't have personhood. It's not a person. We understand the distinction between being and person. And so what we're going to look at, uh, let me get someone to look, at, uh, look up Genesis 1, 1 through 3. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, somebody else look up John 1, 1 for me. Okay. Uh, next, Matthew 3, uh, 13. Awesome. Galatians 4, 4 through 6. Casey? Uh, 1 Peter 1, uh, 1 and 2. You don't want to take it? I thought you were raising your hand. Oh, but you can read 1 Peter. That's a good one, too. Okay. All right, somebody look up 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2 for me. Anybody? Brad? And then lastly, John 15, uh, 26. All righty. Uh, so starting in Genesis 1-1, we're going to look at, so we, we've already seen the scripture affirm over and over and over again that God is, there's only one. There's not multiple gods, there's only one God. And yet what we'll see is there are three distinct persons who are offered worship, who receive worship as God, who are identified as Yahweh, as being with Yahweh, as being on the same level. And so we ha how do we understand this this phenomenon? How do we understand the fact that there are multiple persons receiving worship, there are multiple persons acting in salvation, acting in creation, and yet there is only one God? That's where this concept, this understanding, this doctrine of the Trinity comes from. And so who had Genesis 1-1? All right, go ahead and read that for me, 1-1 one, one through 3. Awesome. So we see that in the beginning, right, I love the way the scripture starts out because they don't really give you any information about God. They just say that he was there, right? The scriptures are, are written on the presupposition that God exists. Uh, many, many things that you will hear uh, taught today, preached today, uh, given to you today, operate on the presupposition that there is no God, that God is not real, that God does not exist. And certainly if he does exist, he has no interest in what takes place today. That's not how the scripture communicates. The scripture communicates that this God just is. And it operates on that, on, on that fundamental and foundational presupposition. And so what we see in this passage in creation is we see the Trinity here in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The earth was, was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. So we see God, right? Yahweh, the one true living God, the Father, identified. God created the heavens and the earth. And God was there creating the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we see God the Father, we see God the Spirit, and then God says, let there be light, and there was light. And so God the Father speaks, and we'll see in John 1, 1 that Jesus is identified as the eternal Word. And what some commentators have pointed out is that when God speaks, right, the Word of His mouth that is the agent in creation is Christ, right? And we see that affirmed uh, later in the New Testament where it says, by, thing, by Him uh, all things were made, and through Him nothing has been made that has been made. Identifying that as Jesus, the Word that God spoke uh, the, the word that accomplished creation itself was, was Christ. Who had John 1.1 1, 1 for me? All right, go ahead and read that for us. Awesome. So this is one of my favorite passages in the Scripture, John 1.1. 1, 1. I don't know biblical Greek, but I have looked up and I have memorized John 1.1 1, 1 in Greek because I think it's fantastic and I feel like it's particularly relevant, especially when we're dealing with the Trinity. So it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One of the difficulties we have when it comes to understanding God and communicating things about God is that we are speaking anthropomorphically. Say that with me, anthropomorphically. It's a mouthful. What that means is we are speaking from a man, from man's perspective, right? We don't really have a way to relate to God because God is not man. God is something else, right? We, we talked about that in, in the songs we sang this morning, that this God is holy. He's completely separate from the creation. But how do we understand him if we are ourselves creations, right? And so when it says in the beginning was the word, right, it's not that God started in the beginning, right? It's not that if you go to the beginning, that's when God started, Instead, what the Greek language communicates is that if you go to the beginning, God already was. He was already there at the beginning. He didn't start at the beginning. He just was already in existence when the beginning came into being. Uh, one thing that we have to understand, and again, we'll look at this some more next week, is that time is a creation, right? Let that sink in for a little bit. Time is a creation. God created time. God does not need time to exist. So when God created time, he was already there to create it, right? Mind-blowing. So in the beginning was the word. As far back as you can go, the word was already there. This points to Christ's eternality. This points to the fact that he is the eternal God. And the word was with God. And there in the Greek, again, this is, the Greek language just illustrates this so much more uh, fully than the English does. It says that the word was with God. But what the Greek denotes is that when the word was with God, there was an intimacy as two people are, are, are face to face, Right? So it's not that just like Jesus was with God in thought or, or in spirit, uh, but, but Jesus was actually with, with God in such a way that there was an intimacy as two people are face to face. Have you ever been face to face with somebody? Maybe a parent or a sibling. I was face to face with my siblings, but that's usually because we were fighting. But there's sort, of, there's sort of an intimacy that comes with being face to face. And this also kind of does away with this idea of modalism where there's only one being and one person who just sort of reveals himself in different ways. A lot of the, a lot of the way people like to explain this is, is uh, by looking at someone like me and saying Drew is a, a man, but he's also a father and a husband and he's somebody's son, right? There's sort of, there's sort of three roles that Drew takes and it just depends upon how he relates to different people. But there's no way that my self as a father and myself as a son can be face to face with each other, right? This kind of does away with that explanation. No, no, no. These persons were distinct, right? They were face to face with each other. And then it says that uh, the word was God. So we see right here laid out the unity of the Godhead that this word was God and yet there was a distinction so much so that these persons were face to face with each other. Uh, all right, moving on. Who had Galatians 4? Go ahead and read that for us. Oh, yeah, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. I skipped that. I stand corrected. 
Again, this is one of my favorite passages when it comes to understanding the Trinity and also defending uh, the Trinity against uh, heresy, against uh, specifically the heresy of, of modalism. And what we see here at Jesus' baptism, Jesus is getting ready to start his ministry. He is getting baptized by John. And what we see is we see Jesus physically in the water. And as he comes up out of the water, the Spirit of God descends on him. So we see God the Son coming up out of the water. We see God the Spirit descending on him like a dove and coming to rest on him. And then we hear the voice from heaven, God the Father. So we see all three persons at the same time. If God was just one being and one person, how could he be in the water and descending on himself and then speaking from heaven all at the same time? It doesn't make any sense, right? We see all three persons here in this work. We've seen him in creation, and then we see him here at Christ's baptism, that all three persons are, are distinct, and yet they are all worshipped, and they are all receive worship as God. All right, then who had Galatians 4? Was that you, Casey? All right, go ahead and read that for us. Again, I love this passage. One of the things we have to understand when it comes to the Trinity is that if there's no Trinity, there's no salvation. Salvation is a distinctly Trinitarian work. This, isn't, this wasn't accomplished by a Unitarian God, a God of, of one being and one person, but it was accomplished by a triune God, a God who is one God, one being in three persons. And we see that identified here uh, in this letter to the Galatians. Born in the fullness of time and gun. God, the Father, sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption to the Son. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we see in the work of salvation, all three persons of the Trinity identified. God the Father sends the Son. He elects the people before the foundations of the world. He sends the Son to go and die for these for, for these people, for their sins, and to rise again so that we too may be risen from our deadness and sin. And then he sends the Spirit to uh, apply that work of salvation to our hearts. It's, uh, it's the work of all three persons of the Trinity. If you, write a, if you don't take any notes or you don't write anything out, you should write this down. If there's no Trinity, there's no salvation. Salvation is distinctly a work of the triune God. And then uh, uh, 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Who had that one for me? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Again, as Peter is writing this letter, he identifies the Trinity as being the, the God that accomplished salvation for these elect exiles, right? According to the foreknowledge of God in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. A lot of people want to say that the Trinity was kind of an idea that came about, uh, you know, 300 years after Jesus at the Council of Nicaea. And you can't actually find it in Scripture. But we see here in 1 Peter, as he's just writing a letter, right? Just doing what he normally does as an apostle, writing a letter to uh, the churches, writing a letter to the elect exiles, he identifies that in salvation, it is the work of three persons, namely God the Father, God the Son, and Jesus Christ, and God the Spirit. Foreknowledge of God, sanctification of the Spirit, obedience to Jesus, Jesus Christ. There's no salvation if there's no Trinity. We have to understand that. Salvation is a distinctly Trinitarian work. And then the last one we're going to look at is John 15, 26. Go ahead and read that for us. Awesome. So the reason I included this uh, passage from John is that often when we think about the Trinity, we understand God the Father as being a person. We understand God the Son as also being a person. But when it comes to the Spirit, we kind of get a little eh, about it. We don't, we don't really understand God the Spirit as a distinct person. Uh, I have a friend who uh, plays music and leads worship in Atlanta. And every now and then, 
he will text me or call me and say, hey Drew, uh, in a couple weeks, I don't have a bass player. Will you record some bass tracks for me? And I say, sure, That's, that sounds like a great idea. So I record the bass tracks, I send it to him, and then he uh, you know, plays those uh, while, he's, while he's playing. He'll have a drummer and some, some more guitarists and vocalists. And what he says when I do that, he says, Drew's here, but he's here in spirit, right? That's not what we're talking about when we talk about God the Spirit. We're not talking about God kind of here, but God not really here, right? The Spirit of God is a distinct person. And we see this illustrated when Jesus is speaking about him here in this passage. Again, in 15, verse 26, he says, But when the Helper, right, the Helper being the Holy Spirit, when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Right? If God the Spirit is just sort of like God kind of being here but not really here, he wouldn't be identified as, as a he but as sort of a, an it, right? Kind of God light. But, but that's not how Jesus identifies him. Jesus identifies the Spirit as a person, calling him he, saying when he comes, the one whom I will send, the person that I'm going to send from the Father, right? Again, we see all three persons. Jesus is speaking of the Spirit that's coming from the Father, and he identifies him as a distinct person. And so we see, right, we see, again, from the beginning of the Scriptures to the end of the Scriptures, there's one God, there's only one God, and yet there are three distinct persons who are identified as God, who are uh, uh, working together to accomplish salvation, who receive worship as God, who are identified as distinct persons. So there's one God and there's three persons. And the last thing we're going to look at is the fact that these three persons eternally exist and they are co-equal and they are co-eternal, right? That means that they are, there's not like, you know, God the Father is the big God and then Jesus is kind of like, you know, not really God, and the Spirit is God, but when, not really when He's here. No, no. All these persons are co-equal. That means they're all equally God. They say are the same substance. They're all the same God, and they are all co-eternal. Some people want to say that Jesus came into existence at a certain point in time, and that, yeah, it was before the rest of us, but Jesus is a created being. Well, if Jesus is a created being, then He's not God. If He had to be formed, I mean, God made that point, right, in the trial of the false gods. He said, there has been no God formed before me, and nor shall there be after me. If Jesus was formed, then Jesus is not God. That's what we have to understand. So these persons are co-equal and co-eternal, and we're just going to look at a few uh, passages of Scripture that, that illustrate this for us. Uh, who, uh, let me get someone to look up Malachi 3.6 for me. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, let's look up John uh, 17, 3 through 5. Who wants to take that one? I'll take that one. And then if somebody will look up Hebrews 13, 8. Awesome. All right, go ahead and start for me whenever you get to uh, the book of Malachi. That's the last book in the Old Testament. You got it? Yeah. Awesome. So what's happening in this book of Malachi is that Malachi is basically uh, prophetically proclaiming the judgment of God against Israel. Right? Israel sinned against God and they are worthy of his judgment and his condemnation because they transgressed his law, right? That, that law that we read in Deuteronomy. They transgressed God's law, they entered into a covenant with him, said that we will keep your law, and they didn't do it. And so God was bringing judgment against them. But what we have to understand is that before God made a covenant with Israel, before he made the Mosaic covenant, the, covenant, the law covenant with Israel, he made a covenant with Abraham. And when he made this covenant of Abraham, with Abraham, typically what happens in a covenant is that two people come together and they say, I agree to do this, and the other person says, and I also agree to do this. But when it came to Abraham, God basically said, I am going to do a thing and I expect nothing from you. I am going to do this thing, I am going to promise to do these things for you, and I don't expect you to do anything to receive this promise. This promise that I'm giving to you is going to be on my, like, I'm going to do it on my own without you. And this is actually a type, and it's foreshadowing our salvation. Our salvation is, is a distinct work of God and God alone. It's, it's not based on anything we could do ourselves. 
And so when God makes this covenant of Abraham, he says, I promise to do these things and nothing that you do or your children do will nullify this covenant. And that's what he's pointing to here in this passage when he says, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. God is pointing to his self-existent nature and the fact that he does not change and says, because I am God and I do not change, that's why I will keep my promise to you. That's why I'm not going to utterly destroy you, Israel, even though I should for breaking my law. Yet I made a covenant with your father and because I don't change, I'm not going to go back on that covenant. Uh, next, uh, John 17. I think I said I was taking that one, right? I think so. So John 17, uh, 3 through 5. Uh, here it says, uh, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross and he offers this prayer uh, to the Father. And what he does, uh, I love it what he says in, in John 17, 3. He says, and this is eternal life that they know you. This is why we're engaging this study at all. It's because eternal life, life itself is wrapped up in our knowledge of God. And everything about life, everything about life for us must be uh, viewed through that lens. It must be viewed in relation to God and, and in our understanding of who God is. And what we will spend eternity doing is just continuing to learn and continuing to grow closer and continuing to grow more in our knowledge of who God is. Eternal life. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom we've sent. And what he says in verse 5, he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existence. Again, Jesus points to not only his uh, co-eternality with the Father. He says, I existed with you before the world began. But he also uh, points to his co-equality with the Father. He says, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Jesus is identified as being equal with God and also being eternal along with God. And again, if Jesus had to be formed, Jesus is not God. But we see that Jesus is, is, is pointing to himself and saying that I have eternally been God and I have received glory with the Father as God. And then lastly, in Hebrews 13, 8. Who had, I think you had that one for me. Yes. Go ahead and read that for us. Again, the author of Hebrews points out the fact that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus doesn't change because Jesus is God, right? And if either he was God always or he was God never. But if he was God, then that means he was God always and he doesn't change. In the same way that we saw that uh, uh, in Malachi that the Father says, I, the Lord God, do not change, right? Because he doesn't change. And Jesus is again identified with the Father as saying that Jesus does not change. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever because he is God, Right? And he is the only God. So I know that we've kind of done a blitz through the scriptures. We have looked at a lot of scripture this evening. But what I want you to understand is that from the beginning of the scriptures to the end of the scriptures, we see that the testimony of God's word says that there is only one God. There is no other gods, right? The, um, the, uh, uh, the Mormons want to say that Jesus was God, but he was also a man. And Jesus is actually only God of this planet. There are other gods of other planets. That's not what the scripture teaches. That's not what God's word says. It says there's only one God. There's not multiple gods. There's only one. And we also see that within this one God, there exists three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are not Unitarians. We don't believe that there's only one being and one person. There are several monotheistic religions that are Unitarian. Islam would be a big one. Judaism would be another big one. They identify that there is only one God. They agree with us in that. They say there is only one God. But they say that this one God only has one, one being and one person. That's not what God's word teaches. We see God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit in creation. We see them in salvation. We see that all of them are identified as God. All of them receive worship as God. All of them are accomplishing uh, creation and salvation as God. And then we see that these persons are co-equal and co-eternal. There's no subordination. And I'm going to throw out some big terms for you. And, and uh, if you have some more questions about this, I'd love to answer them. But it's the difference between what's, what's known as the ontological trinity and the economic trinity. I know that sounds kind of heady and, 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 and kind of a mouthful. But what this has to do with is the fact that uh, ontologically, that means uh, uh, pertaining to God's being, they are all equals. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are all equals. And yet, God sends the Son, and God also sends the Spirit, and the Son also sends the Spirit. So, if they're equals, why is there sort of a hierarchy? Well, in their being, there is no hierarchy. In their being, they are all equally God. And yet, when it comes to uh, accomplishing this salvation, they determine amongst themselves to take different roles in salvation, right? And we saw that, right? According to the foreknowledge of God, the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Christ, we saw that uh, uh, Jesus, God the Father elects a people. Jesus the Son comes down to die on their behalf and to rise again, and then the Spirit comes to apply that work. So although that these, these persons take different roles, that does not take away from the fact that they are co-equal and co-eternal. We have to remember, if salvation, uh, if there's no trinity, there's no salvation. Salvation is a distinctly trinitarian work accomplished by three persons who are all co-equal and co-eternal. And so I'm going to pray first real quick. I'm just going to come back up and he's going to lead us in another song and then we'll be dismissed for this evening. Uh, Heavenly Father, God the Son and God the Spirit, Lord, we thank you that you eternally exist as a trinity. God, we thank you that you are triune. God, that as a trinity, you accomplish salvation for your people. Lord, we recognize that what your word testifies is that there is only one true and living God. And yet within this God, within the unity of this God, there is a diversity of persons. God, and we thank you that you as Father elected a people unto yourself and that you sent your Son to die for them on, on our behalf, to pay the penalty for our sin and to rise again, Lord, and, and that you sent the Spirit to apply that work to our hearts. Lord, without you as Father, without you as Son, without you as Spirit, Lord, we would not be saved. And so we thank you that you were triune. Lord, we thank you that that is true. We thank you that we can trust what your word teaches about that. We thank you for these things and we pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.